Good morning. Uh, and very good morning to David. It's 6.30 for him in the morning. Um, gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor David Salts. And I'll also like to take this opportunity to thank the OC for giving me this opportunity. As I said, it's very, very early morning. I hope he's had a couple of cups of coffee and is all alert to engage us. Uh, Professor David Salts is at the Mitrani Department of Desert Ecology, Swiss Institute for Dryland Environmental and Energy Research at Ben Gurion University, Israel. Uh, I want to extend a very, very special welcome filled with gratitude given the circumstances that David uh, is committed enough to join us online. He was scheduled to take the flight on Saturday evening, I think, and badly to allow before other things started flying in the airspace, so he couldn't take the flight. We miss having David amongst us. Um, I'm sure we'll all be more than happy to welcome him when things return to near normals. Professor Saltz received his BSc in Wildlife Management from the Humboldt University in California, his Master's in Environmental Biology from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and PhD in 1988 in Wildlife Biology from Colorado State University. He did his postdoc at Princeton University, working on the reintroduction of Asiatic wild bass in Israel, with collaboration uh, with the Israel Nature and Parks Authority in Park. Since 1991, he took on the role of coordinating the ungulate reintroductions at the INPA, and he has developed and executed comprehensive multi-year reintroduction plan for Persian fallow deer, Arabian oryx, and roe deer. The plan was designed to incorporate permanent breeding facilities, a sustainable yield strategy, and statistical models that took into account demographics and spatial factors. In 1997, he joined the faculty of Ben Gurion University while still coordinating the reintroduction work. And he has carried out various management and conservation re research studies on gazelles, ibex, wolves, jackals, foxes, and other species. The list is too long. David has advised over 50 graduate students. And in addition to reintroduction, he's been instrumental in developing the sub-disciplines of conservation behavior and movement ecology, both theoretically and empirically. More recently, David has shifted his interest to conservation philosophy and ethics, much needed areas of inquiry, areas with which I hope all of us will engage with. David is extremely well published and a quick scan throws up the following terms. Movement ecology, animal behavior and conservation biology, multidisciplinary frameworks, exploration and exploitation dilemmas, spatial scales, animal habitat relationships through, through a behavioral lens, population dynamics, anthropogenic impacts on animal behavior, including free-ranging dog, integrating animal behavior in conservation, methods and analysis, animal physiology, reintroduction, and that's not a complete list. When I say reintroduction, that brings us to the topic of today's talk, high risk, high cost, et revered. The why, what, and how of introduction. Obviously, there's a lot of question marks that are missing there, but those are the questions he's going to be addressing. It's an extremely relevant set of questions, especially for India in the current context of the recent introduction of African cheetahs, which is probably why I was asked to introduce Professor Salts. Please put your hands together to welcome Professor Salts, and he needs to hear the warmth of our welcome, despite the physical distance that separates us. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. So um, I will, uh, sorry for the delay, um, it was my fault, but uh, we, uh, I will try and complete this within the 45 minutes that are left. So um, th this talk uh, has three parts, right? The why are reintroduction justified? What are the unique attributes that make reintroduction prone to failure? And how should reintroduction be performed to enhance success? And I hope we're able to complete all three. So let's start with the why reintroduction are justified. And I'll, I'll start off with a story which will sort of set up uh, a backdrop for the entire talk. So this is an old map from people who reside around the Mediterranean. And it recognizes uh, uh, three continents, right? Europe, Asia, and Africa. 
all connected at one point in Jerusalem, which is today, uh, you know, in Israel. And uh, during the ancient times, any emperor who had it in mind to get to, to show another emperor on another continent who was boss, they would have to march across this little piece of land. And in doing so, of course, they'd have to eat. So they'd hunt and they'd have to stay warm in the winter. So they chopped down trees. However, they only had bows and arrows and it wasn't that cold. So things sort of went OK. But then in the middle of the 19th century, two things happened. One, George Stevenson invented the railway and a guy by the name of James Lee Paris invented the clip and bolt action rifle, which increased the range of rifles by 500 percent. So when World War I broke out, uh, the Turks were scrambling down from Turkey to, uh, to, the land, to the area of Israel to meet the British who were marching across North Africa. And in order to supply their soldiers, they built a railway. For the railway, they needed a lot of wood to lay down the rails. And then they needed to feed the soldiers. And the soldiers, of course, hunted. But now they had more effective guns. So by the end of World War I, seven of the ungulates that inhabited this land went extinct. These four include, of course, the, uh, uh, the Persian fallow deer, Arabian oryx, and Asiatic uh, uh, wild ass, which I'll focus on today. Uh, but, uh, and I will not deal with the roe deer, which is abundant in Europe. Right now, the story focuses on the Persian fallow deer. The Persian fallow deer went extinct was considered worldwide extinct in 1950. But then in 1956, uh, uh, two small populations were found in Iran near the Dez and Karke rivers. Uh, a pair was eventually uh, transported from these populations to the Opel Zoo in Germany. And later on, breeding cores were also established in Iran. The Nature and Parks Authority in Israel was founded in 1966. And its first director was this guy, Avraham Yofi. And uh, Avram Yofe was a dreamer, and he decided he's going to bring back these extinct ungulates. So he contacted the Opel Zoo and, uh, in Germany and was able to receive two pair. However, shortly after they arrived in Israel, one of the females died. Now he was left with two males and only one female. So he turned to Iran in, at the time that was still under the Shah's regime, and he befriended his, the Shah's brother, Abdul Raza, and finally convinced him to give him a permit to receive four females from Iran. However, this was already 1978, and the Iranian revolution was starting. By December 1978, Abdul Raza causes Avraham Yofe and says to him, you better get somebody over here to pick up your deer, or you'll never be getting them. So Avraham Yofa sends a ranger over to Iran, and when he arrives in Tehran, this is, of course, what it looks like. He hooks up with the local military attache, and they both head out with a truck, and they go through several breeding facilities. They're denied in several places, but eventually receive four females. They return to Tehran and hole up in the, in the embassy where everybody is packing to get out of Iran. Two days later, they all drive to the airport, and as the embassy people get on the plane, the four crates with the deer are loaded up with them and arrive in Israel. By 1996, the breeding corps in Israel has reached 150 individuals and we began the reintroduction. Presently, there are over 300 uh, animals in the wild in four different locations in Israel. So how much did this cost us? Well, my estimate is about 30,000 per individual in the wild. That's pretty high. Now, what about other reintroductions? Wolves in the United States and Yellowstone, somewhere between 200 and a million dollars per wolf in the wild. The otters in England, about a million pounds, not including cost of captivity. Golden lion tamarins, about $22,000 per animal in the wild. And for black-footed ferret over a period of 10 years, $20 million was spent. However, with all that effort, only 50% of reintroductions worldwide succeed. So this is actually a high cost, high risk endeavor. And the question is, why do it? Why are reintroductions justified? 
Well, there are the more instrumental reasons, which are heritage, tourism, and hunting. But the truth is, if you look at all the reintroductions, overwhelmingly, most of them are justified by some sort of moral need to correct the errors that we've done. So what are exactly these moral obligations? And I'll not get into what drives this moral obligation, but rather the problems associated with applying it. And what do I mean? Okay, so we are morally obligated to protect natural biodiversity. Now, notice that I'm using this term that rarely appears before biodiversity, the term natural. Very simply, because if we, we drop it, one could argue that a field with 10 uh, GMOs would be better than a field with nine native species. So you must use the term natural, which means free of human interference. Uh, and in other words, we can say respecting nature's autonomy. So this is very good. So respect if you have a pristine area, what we want to do is just leave it, let it be and do its own thing. However, we don't really have natural, truly natural areas anymore. And then if we want to create a nature reserve, for instance, what do we do? Do we just respect its autonomy and let it go? In which case it may recover on its own, which is very good. It may stay in its damaged state, or it may continue to deteriorate due to cascading effects. So one option is actually to manage it for integrity. The problem of managing for integrity, of course, is that we have to decide on setting uh, some date to which we want to go make it look like, right? So setting some sort of benchmark. And this, uh, this is the problem of shifting baselines, okay? Wh what do you want to return the system to? 10 years ago, 50 years ago, prehistory, okay? The other arguments against doing this is that since you you are and continue to disturb the autonomy of the system, not only that, they some will say that when you're done, what is left is actually an artifact. That doesn't end over there. The future is expected to have serious changes due to man man's activities, okay? What we call global change, right? So now the argument is that we should not manage only for integrity, we should, marry, we should manage for resilience, okay? So uh, we have make this, man, change the system so it will able to withstand global change. So these three things, of course, conflict very much with each other, and I can't get into this. If you want to read more about this, you can see this paper, which I'm putting up here on the right. Let's return to our reintroductions. Reintroductions are active restoration. So what they do is manage for integrity. And what we want to do is we want to establish a population after the former population has gone extinct in a certain area. But this presents us with other problems, okay? Uh, and we have sort of a predicament over here because on one hand, the other pop, the former population has completely gone. So we're not really saving the former population. We're creating this new populations, which animals that we take out of other populations, okay, or in the good case from zoos, we trap them, we dart them, we collar them, and then we put them in an area they're not familiar with, okay? This is obviously not something that they're very happy about. So this creates another contradiction. So what else, what else will justify then these reintroductions? Well, the other justification comes from first, maybe the reintroduction enhances resilience and maybe reintroductions do not only contribute to the structural integrity, but also to the functional integrity. Let's look at this. A, a very well-known example is of course, the return of the riparian vegetation after wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone. Right, so the appearance of wolves back in Yellowstone forced the elk to retreat into the woods and allowed the riparian vegetation, which was degraded by the elk, to recover. So this is a case with predators. But what about ungulates? What do ungulates contribute to ecosystems? Well, their most important contribution is probably through uh, endozoohori, which is the carrying of seeds within the digestive system from one place and deposited somewhere there, somewhere else where they germinate, contributing to the alpha, beta, and gamma diversity. 
So the extinction of large herbivore may result in patchy landscape and actual fragmentation between the plant communities, although the landscape hasn't changed. This is what we term the landscape independent fragmentation. So we looked at this in our reintroduced species. So one of the first things we did is we compared in the desert uh, environment, the two reintroduced species over there, the Asiatic wild ass and the uh, Arabian oryx with the extent uh, uh, Ara uh, Arabian uh, gazelle, the Dor sorry, the Dorcas gazelle. And what we did is we collected pellets of these animals and we germinated them under laboratory condition. And what we found that the Asiatic wild ass uh, <clears throat> transports 15 viable uh, species of, of uh, seeds, the Dorcas gazelles four, in the Arabian oryx, 16. More interestingly, there's very little redundancy. So species tend to, uh, to transport, uh, they tend to transport species that are unique to each one of these ungulates. There was one species you can see here in the middle with the number one that is transported by all, and that's the keystone acacia radiana. However, when we tried to germinate, it, germinate them, we did get, like I said, both from the Asiatic wild ass and the Dorcas gazelle, but we got very few, uh, acacia, but we got most of the acacia radiana germinations from the Arabian oryx. So we looked more closely at what the contribution of the Arabian oryx is to this in terms of does the digestive tract help these things germinate and does the fecal material in which the seed is wrapped help to germinate. So we did this pretty massive germination experiment. And what we found is that seeds that went through the digestive tract of an Arabian oryx and are planted with the pellet have a 250 fold probability of germinating than seeds that just fall off the tree and are planted as is. That's a very big difference, suggesting that the, the acacia radiana's dynamics are strongly dependent on this ungulate. We repeated this ex experiment also with a, a Persian fallow deer who transport the carob tree seeds. And again, we found the same result. We compared it also with, with jackals who eat the carob seeds as well. And overwhelmingly, seeds that went through the digestion of the Persian fallow deer had a much higher germination rate than any other, other uh, conditions. Okay, I'm gonna skip this slide because we're short on time and move on to the next topic. So now we've seen that reintroductions are really important. However, they do to, to tend to fail. And what causes these failures? Well, there are three problems associated with reintroductions. One, the obvious problem of small population paradigm, right? Demographic, genetic, environmental stochasticity. When you do a reintroduction, you, as you, by given, by, you know, it's just given that you start with a very small population. The other problem is that the animals have to deal with a completely novel environment. And how do they deal with that? And the third problem is that in most cases, you have very little knowledge of these animals because if they did not exist in the wild and only in captivity, you know nothing about their behavior, sociality, and habitat requirements. So let's look at our studies at Israel and see what things sort of showed up as we were studying these reintroduced populations. So in terms of the small population the paradigm and demography, so one of the things we've noticed with the Asiatic wild ass that during the first years, reproductive success was greatly suppressed, okay? It increased over time. However, as you see over here on the right, right here, because of the animals that were reintroduced were all of the same age group, this is also collinear with age. So we could not really tell if it's the age or the reintroduction. Only after we had data from wild born individuals did we see how big of a difference it is, okay? So you can see that wild born individual reproductive system is way higher than that of the uh, reintroduced animals. Another problem that showed up with the Asiatic wild ass is that the first seven years, 
of the few uh, animals that were born, two thirds of them were male. And this was significant. And the re this was caused by the fact that mid-aged Asiatic wild ass tend to produce more males than the young females in the older females group. This is a common phenomena in ungulates. And if you select your prime age females for reintroduction, what you're going to get is a flood of males in the beginning, which contribute very less to population growth. However, as these females get older, you should then get a flood of female. Did that happen? Yes, it did. And you get these cycles that wane out as the population, population age distribution approaches normality. We then simulated this population, giving all these data. And as you can see by the uh, two standard deviations, there was really no probability of this population going extinct in the near future unless conditions change. So that looked good. What about genetics? Well, Asiatic wild ass are polygynous. And the moment you release them in small numbers, what happens is that one male takes over the entire herd. He sets up a huge territory, as you can see over here. And he was the only breeding animal. Later on, as young males were recruited, remember we had excess males, they take, they push him to out of part of his territory. You get more territorial animals. And again, more males get to breed. However, this affects the, uh, the effective population size. And to our calculations, over the, the period of eight years, population, the effective population size was about half of what it was of the regular effective population site. We returned to this 20 years later to look at it, looking at it with, with a more advanced genetic techniques which were already available. And luckily we had blood samples available from the animals that were released in the wild. And to our estimates after four generations, there should have been just under four, to our estimates, about 400 an, of these Asiatic wild ass in the wild. Okay. And if the, the problem was only uh, the demographic stochasticity, then we estimated that uh, the effective population size would be about 120. We noticed that there was a problem of, of heritability and reproductive success. So that would lower it even more. And then we have the issue of polygyny, okay? And whether males are very few males breed or more males breed. And this is the line, this purple line is the line of the, um, of, of the actual genetic uh, variants that we found. So as you can see, all these things came into play, not only the demography, the heritability of the reproductive success, and the, the, the polygyny all impact the population. And to our estimates, the, uh, the, the breeding uh, rate is, of the males is somewhere between one, to, one male to each 10 females or one male to each five females. And the effective population size is incredibly low. Okay. Um, environmental stochasticity. Another thing that we found is that uh, the reproductive success of females, this is a desert environment. Oh, by the way, uh, up here on the far right, you can see the picture of the animal the graph is relating to. So this is for Asiatic wild ass. And what we found over here, that female reproductive success depended on the amount of rainfall in the year prior to conception. However, following drought three years, while they were pregnant, the reproductive success fell as well, suggesting that females aborted. So these two things, okay, both the amount of rain before conception and whether it was a drought year or not during pregnancy affected reproductive success. Now, if we look at the frequency of droughts and we had 40 years of rain data for this region, we saw that the frequency over the last 20 years increased quite significantly, although the average rainfall didn't change. So what changed was the variance in rainfall. This is what is predicted for global change. So we added this to our simulation. And now the prediction was far worse than it was before. 
However, I added this blue line over here, right here. See this? That is where the population was actually at. So it didn't perform as bad. And one of the reasons is that after about 10 years, these animals moved up to higher elevations where there is more vegetation and more rain. What about dealing with a novel environment? Okay, when animals deal with a novel environment, they're dealing with an explo explo exploration exploitation dilemma. What this means is that they have to devote energy into learning. And if you know nothing, you have to devote a lot of energy. So how do you manage this, this game between learning and feeding or getting the energy so that you uh, are able to optimize your fitness? So we studied this, and the simulations show that in the beginning, animals should basically devote very short period of time entirely to learning their environment. Okay, then after a while, they will reduce their learning and start uh, start devoting more time to uh, obtaining energy. And as you can see, this first stage has an energy cost, so they're losing energy. This means the animal goes out into the wild and actually begins to starve because he can't, doesn't have time to eat. He has, has to learn the immediate environment he's in. But this is short-lived, and after a while, he maintains a sort of steady state in terms of energy, so no reproduction. And then this ties into what we saw in the Asiatic wild ass in terms of reproduction in the initial years. And there's a lot of effort devoted into learning. Eventually, the animals will settle into a home range, they can maintain the learning at a, at a fixed state and accumulate the energy now for reproduction. How does this pan out in the wild? Well, these are the movements of, of Arabian oryx and Persian fallow deer. And as you can see, the red are the movements in the first four weeks. So there's a lot of movement, but in a restricted area where they're trying to learn the area, okay? The green is the four weeks, uh, is the week, is one week of data, the 52nd week, okay, so at the end of one year. So now you can see they're moving into other areas, they're studying those areas, but they're still returning to the area they know, okay, but they still don't have an established home range, okay, so they're still studying. Once they establish the home range, the other thing that we found is that they still adjust the home range over the next two years. So now they're still putting effort into learning, but now they can devote more time into their uh, fitness and reproductive success. Okay, the other problem that is extremely associated with the explore exploit paradigm is when to stop. Okay, when do you set up a home range? This has to do with what we call stopping theory okay so when you get out there and you're trying to a novel environment and the animals are walking around they have the cost of search okay they have to look around and decide where to go at some point they must decide that okay this looks good enough i'm going to stop but then there's another cost that comes in and there this is the cost of missed opportunities missed opportunities are those opportunities of finding a better home range than you decided on and not going for it, okay? So if you look at the cost of search, which is uh, here in the black line, right? And in the cost of niche opportunities, which would be this red line, okay? And you sum them up, you get the total cost, which is the red line. And you want to minimize this cost, and this will determine what the point at which you should stop searching and establishing a home range. If the costs become higher, as shown in this red uh, dashed, uh, sorry, the black dashed line, okay, if they become higher, then the, the minimum point shifts to the left. What does this mean, okay? What are we talking about? The animals are subject to higher risk, say, which increases the cost, predation. So this means you better establish a home range fast, someplace that you know, before you go out and carrying this heavy risk. What about if, let's look at this one C, we'll skip the B. You can go to the paper over here and see the, the, the details. 
What about if there are other animals already in the wild? Then your missed opportunity costs are lower. They, they become lower faster because the animals that got out before you already caught the better home ranges, right? What happens, as you see over here with the dashed green line, the missed opportunity costs are lower and the minimum overall cost shift to the left. This means if there are animals out there, you better establish a home range sooner. There's no point learning, looking for something better. Let's look at what happens. This is for the Persian fallow deer right here. Okay. This is the home range. This is the distance from the release point of animals that were released in the first release. And at this point, you see they don't return back to where they were released and they restrict their movements to a certain area. This is what we termed as home range stability, the stabilization of a home range. So this is the first release, the solid thin line, second release, the dashed line, and the third release is this thick line, okay? See how fast they establish a home range. They get out there, they look around very briefly, they say, ooh, there are other animals out here. Whatever I find now, that's where I'm going to settle. How about now let's look at the issue of our lack of knowledge. So here are some interesting things that we found. In the Judean hills in Israel, one of the areas we released Persian fallow deer, we used two sources of animals. One from our breeding core, which is subject to very little visitations by humans. And the other source was the Jerusalem Zoo called the biblical zoo. The biblical zoo, like any zoo, is full of visitors who come around and uh, and uh, and make a lot of noise. There's one of those uh, tractor uh, trains, you know, that goes around, okay? So these are very busy places, these zoos. So we released animals from both these areas. And what we noticed, first of all, is that the animals from the breeding facility had a much higher flight initiation distance than the animals from the zoo, i.e. they were more sensitive to the presence of humans, they would run away earlier. However, after they re were released, they sowed much more stress. So it was sort of like, we know something is wrong, but we don't know what we're supposed to do, okay? So that was a, one very interesting thing. Another problem that we did not expect is with the Arabian oryx. We carried out two, re two releases, one after the other, uh, with uh, about a three, three year difference between the two releases. Now, Arabian oryx have very tight social structures. And this is the association between the individuals from the first release after the way we released. And this is the association between the individuals from the herd and the second release shortly after they were released. And after they met, this is what happened to the association. The herds fell apart. And if we look at them both together, each herd, now we put them together, okay, there's actually no herd dynamics. A second problem we had with the oryx that also has to do with our lack of ignorance, that we carried out two reintroductions, two areas of reintroduction. One in the hyperarid environment of the Arava, and the other one also hyper environment of the Paran Desert. Both of these are deserts. However, this, the blue, is a Sudanese biogeographic zone, and the red is the Sahara Arabian biogeographic zone. And when we looked over the first two years, for the two years, in the, in the first two years for the Arava area, 45% of the females gave birth, while in the Paran, only 25%. And we assume this has to do with vegetation. Okay, so we, again, fecal sampling to see if we can see differences in diet. diet. And in fact, there were extremely big differences in diet, with the guys in the Arava having much higher fecal nitrogen as well as higher tannins. And we believe this coming from eating more acacias, which are more abundant in the Arava. And we believe now, although we don't know it for sure, that the tannins play an important role in combating parasites. 
Regardless, we don't know what this contributes. We know this is correlated with the reproductive success. We don't know if this is a true cause, and we do see the difference. Okay, so let's now uh, move on to our final uh, question. How should reintroduction be performed to enhance success? Well, in Israel, what we did is we used a strategy of repeated releases from a breeding core. And the way you maximize the performance of this case is you utilize the breeding core in a maximum sustained yield. And I'll explain this in a moment, okay? However, because you keep your breeding cores at a given size, you have to decide at what point you're gonna end this because you can actually continue reintroduce, reintroducing this way indefinitely. That's the whole idea of a maximum sustained yield. But this technique does enable adaptive management approach, okay, because you can correct as you go along and you can uh, get data from what are essentially replications in time. So let's look uh, a bit more detail how what this looks like over time. So initially you get all the data you can for the animal you want to reintroduce. So this is for the Persian fallow deer. We get, we based on the zoo data, we built a survival curves, okay? And we know that survival in the wild is lower in the zoos. So we adjusted the survival curve as you see by this red line over here. And this is what we used in the model. From the Asiatic wild ass, we use the reproductive success, the reduced reproductive success in the first four years, right? So this, uh, this is the expected that we put into our model, okay? And actually the gray one is what we observed in the Persian fallow deer, which was amazingly similar to this day. I can't believe it came out that close. Once we have all this demographic data, we build a simulation model. And in this simulation model, we play around with the percent of animals we can remove from the, from the breeding facilities, okay, that will maintain the, the breeding facilities at a given size. Then we also simulate and figure out what number of animals for, in each release will reduce genetic stochastic, uh, not genetic, demographic stochastic, stochasticity to an accepted level, okay? Combined with these two things, we can now can figure out how often can we remove animals from the breeding facility and at what number. So for the Persian fallow deer, that turned out to be 12 females a year. And if we simulate the release of 12 females a year, as you can see, this is the growth we project in the wild, okay? And this is what the breeding facility does. There's some variance because some years they perform better than others, okay? And this, is, this would be the projection. If we set then the target goal for the reintroduction to 125 females in the wild, which would put them up into the uh, threatened st stage, uh, st threatened status according to the IUCN. And of course, we've gone way beyond that by now. But if we do that, you can see the cutoff point with the simulation expectation. And now we can actually say, okay, it will take almost 10 years to reach this point. So when you start the reintroduction with these simulations, you can now go to the people who are funding it and say, okay, you're looking at a 10-year investment period at the very least. How did the Persian fallow deer perform in the wild? These are the red squares, okay? Notice they track the, the growth, the projected growth, but are a bit lower. And the reason is because we, instead of releasing 12 per year, we released six twice a year. So these numbers are, are six months behind all the time, but they're tracking the projected growth very, very well. These circles are what the breeding facility does. And you can see over here after 10 years, two things happened. There are fewer animals in the wild, but more animals in the breeding facility. And the reason for that is that for various administrative year, reasons, we had to reduce the number of animals released. Okay, so once you release them, now you get um, uh, data on the actual environment, and now you can improve your model and do a spatially realistic simulation model so you can 
simulate the growth, not only in numbers, but only in space. Why is this important? Well, we simulated these for the Persian fallow deer over the current landscape. And then we got from the government the development plans from the region and simulated this over the development plans. And then we could identify areas that were potential fragmenting elements and could return to the authorities and ask them to change their development plan. Another thing you can do with this is actually you can now select areas using these simulations and select areas that on the one hand will give you the best reproductive success or growth of the population on one hand, which would be not too far and not too close. They can originally connect with your air, with the first area of release. So as you can see, these would be the points that would be the most preferences because it'd be relatively close and not too far and would offer the best growth potential. And finally, after 20 years of the, the re, uh, after, sorry, 30 years of the, uh, in 2016, 20 years of the reintroduction, what we did is we went back to our spatial simulations and we pulled out what was expected to occur in terms of Persian fallow deer, what would be their spatial distribution 20 years later. This is shown over here in this colored area, okay? So the red is where there are a lot of deer, expected with a lot of deer, and the blue, lesser deer, and outside, they're expected no deer. The red and white and black dots over here are actually camera sites. And the black dots are camera sites where deer were sighted, and the whites are camera sites where deer were not sighted. And notice that what we're seeing over here is that the population is actually spreading spatially, but it's doing it more towards the west and not very much towards the east. Now is what you can do is you can take your original model and use multi-model inference to explain the sightings you see in the cameras and add other parameters to see which one would expe explain this deviation, okay? For instance, agriculture, built areas. And in this case, what really made the model jump was the presence of wolves, okay? When we started this reintroductions, there were no wolves in this area. And, and they were coming in now, and they were coming in from the east, and we had sightings of wolves in the cameras in this area. So now there's a new player in town, which is the wolves. And of course, there's good because we want wolves to be around. And there's bad because this hampers the reintroductions a bit. Okay, so very quick summary. Okay, so introductions are, are really a very popular thing. They attract public attention and they provide a sense of atonement. Okay, we're, we're fixing our errors. However, they're not very successful and they're very expensive. The moral justification is mostly due to functional integrity, okay? In returning these functions to the ecosystem to prevent future deterioration of the system. It is usually subject to many unexpected problems, which many of them you've seen here. And really, this is just the part of what we've seen, things that we did not expect. Uh, and the conclusion from this is that you have, if you have a long-term pro project, which is, includes very good post-release monitoring based on repeated releases so that you can use adaptive management, uh, an adaptive management approach, then you can maximize your probability of success. So I would like to thank, uh, all the grad students that were involved in this project and the many uh, nature and parks authority personnel that contributed to it. It could not have done, been done without them. And I want to thank you for listening. Oh shit, I've been talking to myself. Where, where's- Oh, hi, hey. Hi, hi. David. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thanks so much for that talk. Um, it just took us a second to get our mic on. Okay. Um, I, I, I suddenly <laughs> thought I was talking to myself for the past half hour. Okay. <laughs> uh, are there any questions for David in the audience? Yes. Hi, David. Thanks for the talk. Amazing one. I had two questions. First is about the people playing a role in reintroduction. So, for example, this is an example from Madhya Pradesh in India, where there is a community com community conserved area for black bugs, not reintroduced maybe, but this is people taking care of the population and preventing hunting or any kind of damage to, to the population. So, when you are reintroducing ungulates, for example, is there an instance where they interact with people and then there are negative interactions like crop depredation, which then affects your um, interventions like in, in maybe expanding the area, maybe, uh, you know, expanding the home range in, you know, proposed development areas. So how do you go about the people aspect of the introductions? And the second is I'm assuming that the three species that you have talked about have overlapping uh, ranges in the habitat. So does the in introduction or focus like the oryx and the deer is there any kind of a, a situation where the oryx is better at survival and the deer is not able to keep up? So basically competition for resources. So in that case, how does the reintroduction and success get affected? Yeah. Uh, okay. So for the first problem, when we started the reintroduction, we actually contacted the regional council. Okay. And we did some groundwork in terms of public relations uh, informing them of it. And actually, in most cases, there was uh, there was quite a bit of excitement uh, about it because uh, people like it. That's that's the tr that's the truth. However, after they're reintroduced and start to spread, to spread, they do cause they they do uh, well agricult uh, agricultural damage and other car kind of human wildlife conflicts arise. And then they do come back to the Nature and Parks Authority and say, hey, these are your animals. You have to take care of the damages. And actually, this actually went into a court case. And the court's decision was that once the animals are released into the wild, they are considered endangered wildlife. And like all wildlife damages, it is the responsibility of the farmer to protect his crops. OK, either by fencing or other methods. Now, that's very good on one hand. On the other hand, it does cause conflict. And the con and usually what the Nature and Parks Authority does is it tries to accommodate the farmers as much as possible, either financial aid with building the fences and stuff like that. But the conflicts do arise. OK, uh, and and I, I, do, I don't have any golden solutions to this. I'm sorry, uh, but, but that is the reality. Uh, the the other question was concerning uh, competition, say, between the reintroduced animals and the native. I, I assume that's that is what you were referring to. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I can actually see you nodding your head. So, OK, so the assumption is that, uh, uh, yeah, this is a great technology. Uh, so uh, the assumption is that uh, because uh, the, the natural state of this environment was that these two species coexisted, that they won't actually compete, okay? They have actually have different fitness requirements. And that actually, what we saw, you remember with the seed experiment that we did, they each distributed seeds but of different species. So they were e eating different kinds of vegetation. So they have different diets. Good morning, sir. And I have a question that when we are reintroducing some species, when we are reintroducing a species to different locations, if it is the location is say, similar uh, temperature or all kind of climatic is same, then why we consider it is as a, a exotic one? First one. The other thing is when we are considering the biological cycle as a planet of all the tree, all the species, we are reintrodu reintroducing some ex species. Why we should uh, use some economical aspects like 40 crores of uh, uh, money we have spent for 
uh, importing of cheetahs and again whenever we have multiple strategies and analyzing all the habitat uh, management even though there is three biggest failures like walda reintroduction bred orbi and cheetahs even though having a accurate data we are uh, failing to overcome reintroduction so is reintroduction is a biggest failure we can say I, I did not hear very well. Um, what, what is it, what? Uh, so, what were the questions exactly? Can you can you summarize it? Yes, sir. My point is: is reintroduction is exotic, exotic or native is one point. And the oh, other okay. thing is, if uh, we are in a same planet, if we want to reintroduce some species to different region, why there is should why there is need of economic barrier? Second one. And other thing is. there is every time we see the uh, in coming to reintroduction of different species like wild dog bred or we and cheetahs and many more even we are considering few things but it, it resulting in uh, tribal conflict or animals death he is truly justified we can see in the conservation as taking uh, re reintroduction is true okay okay so so let, let me see that i understand so the first question really has to do with should we reintroduce exotics is, is that is that a true summary of the point you're making okay yes sir two similar ecosystems yeah yeah okay so two similar two similar ex ecosystems but in one introduce exotic and the second one the native no sir we have two diff we have two same uh, climatic conditions and we are introducing one species in that uh, uh, other uh, location why we should consider it is as a exotic if even though the conditions oh are okay okay because you say we're introducing them what seems to be the same relative similar conditions but we have no data that they were ever there right so um well that that's a good point uh you're you're getting here into the philosophy of conservation and this would be a very long argument for what i would say is that um you would have to be very very careful because what we often look at ecosystems and consider them to be roughly the same could be very very different and the question of why the animal wasn't there uh is a very big question even if it wasn't there it never reached it because there was some sort of barrier the system has evolved without it so it would be different in certain respect so this is not to say that exotic should never be reintroduced they may be needed to be reintroduced to maintain the system's resilience if you have no other option but you have to consider this and there are pluses and minuses and i would str strongly strongly recommend that you read the paper about principle pluralism about how these decisions uh, should be made okay by now i forgot your second question i'm sorry i'm old uh maybe we can take one more quick question from someone else yeah hello uh thank you so much david for the talk it was very interesting uh my question is about uh, while doing re reintroductions how do you decide upon the uh, sex ratio of or uh, the individuals that will be reintroduced is it just exactly similar to what's found in uh, in in natural environment or is it something different oh we well basically we uh, <clears throat> it it's it really depends of course on the species so in the fur persian fallow deer we just do a 50-50 okay uh for the arabian oryx it's different because of the strong tight social structure the the male there's there's a close knit herd right and there's an alpha male there there are very few males uh, that are uh fully adult so what we do is we release them with the we we create a group we maintain it in captivity as a group for for a long time okay and in this group includes younger males so they'll play a role in the future but that they're 
clearly subordinate and will not challenge the male in the alpha male in the near future. Okay, so that that's the uh, the another example. But as a rule, you for the Asiatic wild ass, you know, you just release 50-50 and the strong males win. Right. So sociality is one thing that needs to be considered uh, importantly. Oh, yeah, for sure. Right. For sure. That was one of the, the slides I showed you. And, and, and if you have no data from the wild, it's very, very difficult to predict, to predict what's going to happen. So all you can do is try and emulate the social structure that you think is correct. Right. That ans answers my question. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, David, and thank you for your questions as well. This okay, thank you very, very much for this opportunity. I want to thank all the organizers and the people I've worked with who put in a lot of logistic effort, which regretfully, very regretfully, didn't pan out. But I, again, I'm happy I was able to give the talk. Thank you. So are we, David. Thank you.